Turn in your Bibles, please, to Daniel chapter 1. Seeing how Daniel's gone, we'll preach about him. Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. Just want to have just a little small devotion tonight. May get longer than I think, but usually does. But I... Um, I want to talk about that which is so important to us. Daniel chapter 1 and verse number 8. It's the heart. Now, I don't have to worry about this crowd right here. But I want to put some thought in your mind about how I feel a heart should work. Now, you will notice that Daniel was a man of God. But his theme in his life was his, his heart and how he controlled his every thing by his heart's, his heart's desire. Notice what it says, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Now understand that he purposed himself. He says, the one thing I'm not going to do is defile myself. Now you say, well, that's, that's not hard to do. Oh, that is, that's real hard to do. Very, 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 very hard to do. Someone once said that a heart, the strongest heart is the one that's scarred the most. Someone also said, that a heart will break very quietly. But God is the only one that can know the heart. Each and every one of us has the opportunity, and the, everybody in the world, as far as that goes, has the opportunity to purpose in their heart if they want to. Now, Daniel wanted to. He wanted to be a man of God. When you're a young man and you get saved, like when I did, I, I knew that my heart had to change. I had an evil heart. For from within, out of the heart of man proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, Thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, pride, foolishness. Then it says all these things come from within the heart and defile the man. So we know we're sinners, right? And sinners do wicked things. 
But now you have Daniel who said, now look, I'm going to purpose in my heart not to defile myself. So if Daniel can say that, you can say that, anybody else can say that, if they have the desire to do that. Now, I can't tell you exactly how it works for every preacher or everybody that's in the ministry or in the leadership, deacons or whatever they may be, but I can tell you how it worked with me. I do not know the heart of anybody in this room. I don't know your secret sins. You don't know mine. Nobody knows those. Um, are the things that you've done you wish you hadn't done. The things you thought that you shouldn't have fought. I like listening to Billy Graham. I have my devotions with him every morning at 6 o'clock. And he's always telling him about the evilness in his life. That he was things that he's. I'm glad you don't know, he said. I'm just, he's, now, I don't think he was a, a wicked man. I think he was a godly man. But he wasn't a perfect man, as you are not in, here in this room, a perfect man either. You'll, you, you'll get mad. You'll get upset. Have you ever got upset in traffic? Does traffic upset you? Does a slow driver, when you're in a hurry, upset you? Going up a hill behind a big semi-truck, does that upset you when you can't pass? Well, sure, you're going to tell me, oh, man, I sit back and relax, take it easy. man. I'm... But if you're in a hurry, do you ever get in a hurry? Have you ever been late? Have you ever seen things that you wished you hadn't seen? Well, your heart is what God deals with. He deals with a man's heart. So it was good that Daniel purposed in his heart not to defile himself. I think when you come to salvation, you have to understand that we realize, as we should realize, that our heart is our nucleus. It is our launching pad. It's our headquarters. Everything comes from within the heart of man. I was going to read something to you. Helen Keller said, the most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. Now you know love and you, and you know hate. But you know when that baby gets here, moms, and they lay that baby upon you, you know love. You know what is yours. What came from you. The gift that God has given you. You see that. There's no feeling like that feeling when a mother holds her baby. A mother who loses her son in the military and a soldier. How he'll weep and cry as their soldier comes home, not like he left, strong, healthy, and happy, and going out to honor and serve his country, he comes back in a box. He's not coming back the same way he left. The pride, the excitement, and the fact that her son was uh, going to be a soldier, and the pride she had in him, all of a sudden she feels what happens when they lose somebody they love. Then you meet your, your wife. I met Debbie in 1962. I had no clue. I love her more today, by the way, than I've ever loved her. I found out what the better or worse is about. I know what the worse is. But you know what? The day I met her, 1962, July the 22nd, I think it was. 
She was just 14 years old. It took a little while, like it does for anybody, but all of a sudden, I couldn't think about nothing but her. We went together four years. We went steady, then we were engaged for a year. I loved her. I loved her with everything I had in me. And I didn't love easy. I came out of homes and I came out of uh, uh, one divorce after another divorce and marriages that fell apart and all kinds of stuff. You all know the story. Don't have to tell you. It wasn't easy for me to fall in love with anybody. So I chose to fall in love with sports. I wished I hadn't, but I did. At the time in my life, I didn't know any better. I think it's wrong to do that now. But um, I don't encourage, I mean, I, I want you to be very active, Drake. Very active and do it. But I don't think that should be first in your life. You understand what I'm saying? I think you're a good athlete. There's no doubt about it. But that should not be first in your life. God should be first in your life. It's important that we find out. When Debbie and I got married, the, um, the thought divorce never entered our mind. Now, you understand I come from divorce, 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 divorce. All kinds of divorces. Between my, t my two, my biological father, my stepfather, and my mother, there's 20 marriages, supposedly. But they have been married that many times, supposedly. My dad was claimed to be married 10 times, three to, the one, three to one woman, three times to one woman. He was, then he was married three times to three different, three different women at the same time. I think that's trigamy. Two's bigamy. I got no clue what three is, do you? That's what I call it. But I have been around that kind of stuff all my life, living and raising up poor and poor and poorer. We did not have a car in our house. I, went down, I, I did the grocery shopping from 12 years old on, on a bicycle with a basket on it. Grandma would give me a list and I'd go get it. So I knew what it was like to not have anything and to be bitter but then a woman comes in your life as a kid. We went together four years. She t we tell everybody that, uh, that she went with me through my junior and senior year in high school. Then I turned around and went with her through her junior and senior year in high school. Then we got married. We got married 30 days after she graduated. She graduated June 1st, 1966. She got married on July 1st, 1966. But she has been the love of my life. I love her. We've had fun together. Just like you're supposed to. So that's love. That's when you fall in love. I mean, there's everyone here can tell that story. Brother McGua could tell that story. Seventy some years to the same woman. He loved very much from the time they were kids. They probably played hooky and went and got married. I don't know the whole exact story, but I know they went back to school after they got married, didn't you? I'll tell you what I think about Mr. McGew that amazes me. Mr. and Mrs. McGew got married. They went back to school and graduated him, the salutatorian, and her, uh, no, the valedictorian, and her, the salutatorian. Am I saying that right? Pretty good deal. But they loved each other. But love, you can beat it and kill it. You know what I'm saying? Courtship is very important when it comes to love. Turn to Romans chapter 10 with me, please. I had, I was not a romanist, a romantic kid growing up. I was involved in sports, didn't have girlfriends. I had one girlfriend outside of Debbie. That's all I ever had. She was a very special girl, but she's a special lady today. She, her and her husband had been to this church a number of times to hear me preach. We have been friends ever since we were in the third grade. She was the only other girl that I ever cared about. She chewed me out all the time. She couldn't understand why I couldn't be nice. 
she would yell at me. Why can't you be nice? But she never did ever give up on me. She always liked me. Now we broke up. She was in, I mean, she dumped me in the sixth grade. Broke my heart. And, uh, and uh, she, said I, she said, that's a lie. She said, I moved. <laughs> and that's what happened to us. <laughs> but it didn't matter. She was the only other person. I wasn't involved with a lot of women. You know what I mean? I liked every girl was just that, a girl friend. They were friends. Nothing else. No dates. I didn't want anybody to see my, where I lived. I didn't want any girl to come to my house and see how I had to live. I didn't want anybody to see where, where I had to sleep. I didn't want anybody to see that. So I stayed away from that. But then you fall in love. When I fell in love, I made up my mind when Debbie was only 15 years old, I was going to marry her. Now, you, some people say that's crazy. Well, I told her mother when she was 15 years old, I'm going to marry your daughter. Her mother laughed. But I got the last laugh. I married her, and we've been having fun ever since. Debbie never dated anybody but me. I told her, no need. Why would you want to marry anybody else? I mean, why would you want to date anybody else if you got me? That's supposed to be funny. <laughs> but anyway, actually, she did break up with me one time. And when I was a senior in high school, she broke up with me. She said she wanted to date the guy that had hair on his chest. I told her, Mike, that hair did not grow on steel. He said, or rubber. <laughs> but anyway, when I was 16 years old and then 17, I went to church and had my second love affair. My first love affair was a little girl that I could only see once a week for year after year after year, and I had to walk 18.6 miles to see her. Now that's love. Then I fell in love again. On March the 3rd, 1963, I was sitting in church listening for the first time. I'd gone to church a number of times, but never listened. By the way, there's a lot of people come here and never listen. I look over here to this section sometime. I watch them on their telephones. They're not listening to the thing I'm saying. Now, these two over here will because I've already pointed them out. And I love these two over here. Drake's like my own kid. I'd do anything for Drake. Drake knows it. And I want to be a fatherly figure to him or grandfatherly or whatever you want to call it because I love it. I see things in Drake and a few others. But you see, the thing of it is, is that I went to church and did not listen. I wasn't no different than you guys when you guys are talking or when a bunch of you are talking. I wasn't no different than you. I did the same thing. Wasn't right. Wasn't right when you don't do it. We come to church to listen, amen? I should have been listening. But one day I did. Then all of a sudden I found out what the cross was all about and how Jesus suffered and died on that cross for me. I figured that out. I didn't like the way they treated him on the cross. I began to fall in love with him and didn't really even know that he was God. But then I found that out. That Jesus was God manifested in human flesh, came to die his sole purpose was to die for our sins. And I fell in love with him. Then the Bible says that when it comes to our Savior, your heart must be involved. If the heart's not involved in your salvation, you have no salvation. None. Zero. Notice it says in verse number 9, please, of, of Romans chapter 10, verse number 9. That if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus. And by the way, when you become a Christian, it's not a problem for you to confess Christ with your mouth. It bothers me when people say they're saved but never talk about Jesus. Why not? I would much rather talk about Jesus than anything else in this world today. Jesus died for me. He loved me. He gave me eternal life. 
He's given me good health. He's given me one blessing after another blessing, after another blessing, after another blessing. He's been good to me. Has he been good to you? No problem with loving him. Oh, how I love Jesus. Isn't that the song? Oh, how I love Jesus. That's why I have no problem singing that in front of people. Notice it says in verse number nine there. It says that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine what? Heart, not head, not mind, but heart. It's got to be a heartfelt religion. It's got to be in your heart. And when it's in your heart, let me tell you something. When it's in your heart, when you fall in love with a woman and she's in your heart, you think about her all the time. When you fall in love with Jesus, he's in your heart, you think about him all the time. I see people that don't think about Jesus at all until Sunday when they go to church and hear about him. Is there something wrong with that? To me, there's something wrong with that. I lay in bed, talk to Jesus. I get up in the morning and I talk to Jesus. I listen to a devotion every morning and, and hear about Jesus. What Jesus has done for me. How he's loved me. How he cared for me. Oh, how he cared for me. Oh, it was the same way with my friends. I have... A lot of friends. And you love your friends a little different. It's not the same kind of love that you have for God, or it's not the same kind of love that you'll have for your wife. But your friends, a friend, the Bible says, loveth at all times. Not some of the time, but all the time. Love. The Bible says in verse number nine, that if thou shalt confess with the mouth the Lord Jesus, shall believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. There's a number of things that it says that it's going to get you saved, but you better not forget what they are. That you believe in your heart. The word believe is very important there. The word heart is very important there. That is, thou shalt confess with your mouth. By the way, it's Time to open up your mouth that God give you and tell, and tell people about the Savior that gave you the mouth and your heart. I tell people, I said, well, I'm a Christian. He said, one guy asked me one time, he says, are you a Bible thumper? I said, I don't know necessarily what that means, but I'm a hellfire and damnation preacher. He said, well, you're a Bible thumper. They scare people. I said, I'd rather, okay, I, what, what, what does it matter I'd rather scare somebody and get them to heaven than not. Wouldn't you? I'll tell you one thing. I got scared one time when I was a kid. I was walking in the woods. I was walking by the woods, excuse me, on a road when I was about 10, or 11, well, maybe 11, 12 years old. And a man jumped out of the woods. I thought I died. That's how scared I was. I want you to know something. I would rather scare somebody like that. Now, I don't think that's the right way to do it. I, you know, I think preaching the gospel and people responding to the gospel is the right way to do it. I think taking the Bible and showing somebody how to be saved is the right way of doing it. But what are you going to do? Scare somebody in hell number one, hell number two, hell number three? Where are you going to scare them to? If I, I want you to know what, if Noah's family wasn't scared that day when the rain came for the first time, what would you done? When you heard that rain pouring down, never rained before, you guys. Never, never rained before, but it was pouring down, bucket loads. And it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Inside, Noah would preach to his kids. Do you think his kids was normal? Do you think his kids was normal like us? I think so. They heard that pounding and pounding and pounding for 40 days, not 40 days, and 40 nights and pounding. And all of a sudden, they felt that boat lift. What would, you, what would your heart feel like? For the first time, you're lift off terra firma. You're, you're coming off the earth. And away you go. I think they're as normal as any other person. All they did was by faith do what God told them to do. But the rest of them drowned. 
died. A miserable, suffering death, beating on that ark, trying to get in probably. Help me, help me. I, I use an illustration. Um, there's an individual who attends church here sometimes. I ain't going to mention no names. You all know who he is. Never, hasn't been, I don't suppose he's been in church maybe one time in the last two years. Now, something's happened to somebody very close to him. He's on the phone to the church. You got to help me. You got to help me. Well, why don't you go down to the tavern and have the bartender help you? That's where you're at all the time. Why ask the preacher? It's amazing about people. He's scared. You know why he's scared? Because things is not going his way. And by the way, you get scared too when things don't go your way. Have you ever lost control of your car? And all of a sudden you had this go through your body? Like what's going to happen next? I went like this one time down a road one time on ice. And I was wondering, well, how's this going to end up? <laughs> Have you ever done something like that? Have you ever heard something that you think was in the attic? <laughs> My wife one time woke me up at two o'clock in the morning. Said, Sandy, somebody's in the attic. I don't hear nothing up there. Somebody's in the attic. I heard, I know there's somebody in the attic. <sighs> well, she says, take me to Sandra's. I said, no, I'll just go up and check the attic. No, because if you go up there and get killed, I don't want to be down here. So I took her to Sandra's. Me and Wayne went up the attic. There wasn't nothing up there. But she was so scared that she woke up and screamed. Ladies and gentlemen, where does that come from? Fear. And it affects your heart. Well, salvation comes along and you believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. The word saved is probably the most important word you'll hear. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Saved, saved, saved. I'm glad I'm saved. You know what? Fear, a lot of that fear has gone from me since the day I got saved. I don't have that no more. My heart now is secure in the Lord Jesus. If I die, regardless of how it is, and I will die. The way I feel the last month and a half, I, I'm thinking we're getting close. But it's, I'm not probably, but who knows? Who knows? People die. A lady sits right there about where Brenda's at. Um, and Mrs., uh, not Brenda, you. <laughs> Debbie, is that right? Debbie, about where you sat, died this last week. She comes to church every Sunday night here. She's not a member here. She goes to her son's church, her and her husband. But they come here on Sunday nights. You guys know who they are. Sweet people. You don't know when you're going to die. What's going to happen to you? That day they shut that shuttle up. Who knew? That teacher, first teacher going up in space. Boom, dead. All of them dead. You don't know when you're going to die. John Kennedy, we celebrated his assassination uh, that took place in 1963, November the 22nd. He was just waving at people. Next thing you know, he's dead. You don't know when you're going to die. But when you get saved, something happens to your heart that you don't really care. I don't care if I die because I know I'm going to a better place. In salvation, look at verse 10. For with the heart man believeth unto what? What is righteousness? Right doing or doing right. So when you get saved, guess what you start doing? Right. Now, they got a lot of big words for things in the Bible that we, that we make that, that, that sounds big, but they're really simple, like tabernacle. That's a tent, simple tent. Righteousness just means that you're going to start doing right. Sanctification means set apart. You know, you're going to be set apart. Uh, repentance, simply change your mind about one thing and start living another way. Simple as that. In salvation, 
For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So the heart plays a big part in your salvation. How many saved? Say amen. amen. You're not to judge anybody, but have you, have, you, have you ever talked to somebody that says they're going to go to heaven that you just don't see it? You just can't hardly believe it. Now, we're not a judge, but you can know a Christian by their fruits. Amen. God's creation. I mean, when he makes an apple tree, you know it's an apple tree. How can you not tell it's an apple tree? It's got an apple on it. Well, what's a Christian supposed to have on it? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. I mean, you show that you're a Christian by the way you live. Not just Wednesday night, just not Sunday, but every day of the week, seven days a week. Is your heart in service? Is your heart in serving? Sometimes it bugs people to death. You know, Mrs. Seba is a servant. Mrs. Seba cleaned the stools. She never complained about it. Not one time to me. She'd go to the kitchen, she cleaned it up. She didn't complain about the mess in the kitchen. She was a servant, she just cleaned it up. Most people just say, look at that kitchen. Well, I know the kitchen is sometimes dirty, but a servant cleans it up. Amen? You clean it up. Because that's your job when it comes to service. If you love being a servant. Some people don't love being a servant. Some people just love to sit, soak, and sour in a church. Just preach to me, preacher. But I'm not going to do nothing. I'm not going to do anything on my... I have to have a work day and beg people to come out for people to come out. People are going to come out automatically. It's the ones that come out automatically and say, what can I do? Is there something I can do to be of assistance? Can I help the pastor? Can I help the church? Is there something I can do? I got people that come automatically on their own just to put in... Um, offering envelopes. Or they'll come out and cut the weeds. Or they'll weed eat. Or they'll, or they'll mow grass. Or they'll do something else. We got, we got somebody around here. Darren does it. But you know what? Darren is like anyone else. He wouldn't mind somebody helping him out. Just like anybody else. You know, I mean, I'm at that point where I can't hardly do nothing. So I probably will have to pay for things to get done. But... Um, uh, I don't mind. I, I, I told you about what I did with my next door neighbor, didn't I? My next door neighbor, Bob Carpenter, I love him. He loves me. When, I, when he first moved in there, he wouldn't talk to me. He wouldn't even look at me. I'd drive into my driveway, which is right next to his driveway. He'd turn his back. He would not even look at me. He found out I was a preacher. He didn't want to have anything to do with a preacher. In fact, he almost didn't buy the house because he didn't want to live next door to a preacher. Can you believe that? One day I saw him shoveling gravel into a wheelbarrow. I hate wheelbarrows. I hate wheelbarrows. I hate shoveling rock into wheelbarrows. I hate taking that, rubbing that, taking that wheelbarrow and going up grass. It's harder to do it on grass than it is on pavement of some kind. You know what I'm saying? So I went out there, didn't ask him. I just took my shovel, put it in my wheelbarrow, went out there and started shoving rock. He looked at me and said, you don't got to do that. Well, I said, I do too, Bob. Why? I said, because you're my neighbor. The Bible says, love your neighbor, Bob. I wouldn't be a very good neighbor if I didn't love you. <sighs> so anyway, for about an hour and a half, killing me, killing me, back and forth. With that, finally, he said to me, you want a Coke? I said, sure. Yeah, I like a Coke. I don't like anything. Water, Coke, lemonade, anything. Just to stop from shoveling. I'd have taken anything. And we become the best friends. Do you realize to this day, he will not let me do nothing. He mows my grass. He shovels my snow. He took my uh, weed eater away from me so I wouldn't use it anymore. He took my weed eater and put it in his garage. He said, you know, you don't need to do that. 
I had some money in my house, in a, in a little bitty safe. Wasn't much money. But when I left town, I took all my money and put it in his safe next door. He said, you're the only man I can imagine that would do a stupid thing like that. I said, I trust my neighbor because I love my neighbor. Him and I have become the best of friends. He's going to be one of my pallbearers when I die. He runs over every day, checks on Debbie. He knows my code to get in my house. He, you know, he is to me, by living next door, like Steve Russell, uh, Steve Russell is to me in this church. I've never had a trouble asking Steve to help me. He's been my friend for since. Steve Russell came to Elm Grove Baptist Church the same day I did as pastor. He was here that same day. He was the first person to walk down the aisle in my ministry. You can't hardly believe I remember that, do you? He wanted to drive the bus. He said, I come down the aisle because I want to be the bus driver. Let me tell you something. Loving the people that I have loved for so many years is a pleasure for me, especially when it comes into service. Over and over again, I have been in the hospital to visit you. Nobody's ever come see me in the hospital. I've never been in the hospital. I suppose you would if I was, but I've just never been in the hospital. Nobody's ever have come visit me. I don't get sick much. I'm always here unless I'm on a vacation or preaching someplace else. Well, aren't you ever sick? No. I'm sick, but I never get sick on Sunday or Wednesday. I ask God to make me sick on Monday and Tuesday. I ask God to make me sick on Thursday and Friday. You don't think God will do that? Sure you will. He knows you ought to be in church. He told you you ought to go to church. So if he knows your heart is in church, then get sick when you get sick. Now, I'm not saying he's going to do that for you, but have you asked him? I don't know. How about in tithing? I got to quit with this. Always good to get on this subject, isn't it? You see, if you get saved, your billfold ought to get saved too. Amen? Don't you think your billfold ought to get saved? That's what the man said when he was getting baptized. The guy said, hey, hey, I noticed your billfold's in your pocket. He said, baptize me. I want that thing baptized too. So he baptized his billfold. Money is the thing that gets to people more than anything. But if you got money, you want to keep it. Just, but look, in, in the church is some of the biggest hoarders, some of the biggest um, uh, tightwads. Have you guys ever gone down to Lake of the Ozarks and gone down Clinton, gone down and went by tight, Tightwad, Missouri? I love that. But I love it when you go by and say Tightwad Bank. <laughs> Have you seen that? You know about that? Tightwad Bank. I got a picture of it on my phone. I said, man, what a perfect name for a bank. Tightwad. I think it's crazy. I don't know if it's First National Bank of Tightwad or no. I think it's just Tightwad Bank, I think is what it is. I have to look at it. I got a picture. But anyway, the thing of it is, is that people, I don't, if I give it to God, well, I won't have it. If I, if I, if I give it to God, I, I won't be able to buy a boat. And God gave you everything you got, including life, health, and everything, your family. We know from here, hey, we know God giveth and God taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When God takes your loved one, and he's taken a lot of you guys' as loved ones in this room, They go to a better place. You wouldn't want them to come back to this mess. I'll guarantee you Norma McGew is having a blast in heaven. If I know her like I know her, she's right doing exactly what God has for her to do while she's up there waiting. She's waiting for her glorified body. That's something that's coming someday. We're going to get ours too. How many ever had any pain? How many don't want pain? How many don't like pain? I can't stand pain. It hurts. I'm allergic to pain. <laughs> but anyway, what, it, it, it pains some people just to take them. Uh, it's like the kid that walked down the street. His mother gave him, had given him two nickels. 
He said, honey, this nickel's for Sunday school. This is for God. And this nickel's for you when you come home. And he went down the street and fell. And one of the nickels fell out of his hand, ran into it, and went down a sewer hole. He looked at it and said, well, goodbye, God's nickel. Even as a young age, that kid knew he wasn't going to give up his money. But he would give up God's. Oh, Don, years ago used to say, don't give Brother Steve any money, he'll just give it away. Money means very little to me. I like nice things, just like anybody else does, but I know what it's like not to have nice things. But you see, tithing is something. Why not give back to God that which is His? If you make $500 a week, give $50 to God. Well, huh, huh, huh. have you guys been to the doctor lately? Maybe God won't let you get sick. Maybe, maybe you'll make up for that, losing that $50 to God by Him blessing you with no medical bills. But He'll get His tithe one way or the other. Mark it down. Then in cooperation. This is a close one, a quick like. I think we ought to have our heart in cooperating with one another. We need to cooperate. We, use, we need to use our heads and think. We need to cooperate one with another. If somebody needs help, help them. Volunteer. I don't like the nursery. Nobody does. But there's a verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I think it says, it says, and, they must all be, and we must all be changed. So go work in a nursery and fulfill that scripture. Them kids need to be changed. When they get old, they need to be changed. Look, cooperate. Volunteer. Ask what the deacons what you can do. What can I do? What can I do to help you? If your heart is in the church, you'll do that. What can I do to help you? One of the biggest phrases you can say that's built around love. What can I do to help you? Is there something I can do for you? What can I do? God's good. And God deals with your heart. And there's a lot, it's been said about a lot of people. That man's heart is not right with God. It's been said about a lot of women. That woman's heart is not right with God. Have you ever said that? Have you ever thought that? Well, maybe sometimes they're not right with God because we don't try to help them get right with God. That's what we need to try to do more. Thank you very much. God bless you. Father, bless this lesson to the hearts of the people. Now, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.